All right. Good morning, everybody, and Shabbat Shalom. For those of you that may not know the beauty of the word shalom, it's not just another word. It is a state of being. It is a, it, it basically means that nothing is broken. Karen, come tell me what all shalom means. I know it means nothing is broken. Nothing broken, nothing missing, and there's nothing lost. Oh, I love that. Nothing broken, nothing missing, nothing lost. Hallelujah. The Lord. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing broken, and nothing lost. Nothing broken, nothing missing, and nothing, nothing lost. lost. I declare that. Every, I declare you ought to go to Atlanta with me. Amen. Anyway, nothing broken, nothing lost. I would, everything is just as it should be. So when you tell someone shalom, you are telling them, you are prophesying to them that nothing is broken, nothing is missing, nothing is lost, that everything is the way it should be. God's in control. Have no fear. So this morning, I wish every one of you Shabbat Shalom. Now, why do we say Shabbat? Because today is the Shabbat, the Sabbath of the Lord. It's the seventh day of the week, and it's a very special time in the economy of God. And so today, it's a special gathering. Everyone that's here today are special people. Every one of you have been called by Yahweh to be here. And, um, Guys, we have right at 90 students this morning. I'm so thankful for all of you that love to hear the word of God. Someone said, what is Shabbat? I'm, I'm going to have to turn this chat off. I can tell. I normally don't look at the chat. But uh, Shabbat means Sabbath. Today is the Sabbath day. So it's a very special day. All right. So how do I hide these chats so I don't get all distracted? Let's see. Uh, everybody thinks I'm smart, but I'm really not. Is yours merged to your screen or is it there a pop-out box? Oh, it's a pop-out. Okay. Yeah, so, you should be able to click it off. Oh, wonderful. Oh, yay. Oh, hallelujah. Wonderful. Okay. All right. We're ready to share our screen. Everybody get your Bible unless you're driving. If you're driving, do not get your Bible. Okay. <laughs> But everyone else that's just sitting around the house on this beautiful Sabbath morning, grab your Bibles. Never believe anything I teach. Don't believe anything your pastor teaches or your TV preacher preaches. Line it up with God's holy word and uh, open it with your own eyes. See it so that you will not be deceived in these last days. We're living in a time of great deception. The Bible said the whole world has been deceived. Revelations 12 and 9 said the whole world has been deceived. Rosie, if you'll get ready to do some reading for us, we appreciate you always reading so eloquently and plainly for us. Um, today, I'm going to enter into a subject that is very confusing for a lot of people. Today, I'm going to begin a journey to help you understand the, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is one of the most misunderstood apostles of all the apostles. And today, I want to teach you how to interpret the Apostle Paul's writings, especially concerning that subject that is so confusing for people. Law and grace. Law and grace. If you'll go to most Christian churches, you will hear that the law has been done away with. You will hear that we're now living in an age of grace. Let me look and see by a show of hands real quick. How many has heard what I just said? in your local church. Can I see you just a wave of a hand? Okay. All right. Okay. 
Pat, don't you raise your hand because you know you don't hear that in your church. <laughs> Amen. That is the general consensus that the law has been done away with. And now we're living in an age of grace. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring you to the word of God. And we're going to study the Apostle Paul. Because you're going to find out today that Paul and his writings can be, they are the most amazing writings in the Bible probably, but they can be the most dangerous writings in the Bible if you take them out of context. So today I would like to introduce you to my Bible college lecture that I did years ago at our church. And this lecture is, uh, it really is life-changing. It is mind-changing, and it is from our Bible college days when we had a Bible college at our church. We're going to resume that Bible college the first of next year. We're going to do it every Sabbath morning at our church locally. So if you would like to graduate from a Bible college with your bachelor's degree in theology, uh, we're going to be resuming that Bible college for, the, for our local folks. So as you can see, today's lecture title is called Presenting Paul. Now, before I go any further, this booklet is available free of charge on our church website, not Toto's website, but firstharvestchurch.org. So everything I'm going to be teaching today, if you want to run, grab that real quick and download it, you can have that in your files. You can print it out or read it as a PDF on your screen. So Courtney, would you maybe try to go find that book real quick? It is over at firstharvestchurch.org under eBooks and make that link available to the class today. That's already on it. Of course you are. <laughs> Courtney, where do you live? In Pennsylvania. Oh, I, Mark of the Beast is coming to Pennsylvania. You need to oh. come on down to Mississippi, okay? I'm praying for it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. All right. What did Paul really mean when he said that we are no longer under the law? And it wasn't it Paul that said that no flesh is justified by the works of the law? It is. That's exactly what Paul said. Paul made those two statements there at the top of your screen. And those two verses of scripture have been used throughout God's church to eradicate the need for the law of God. We are not under the law, and no flesh is justified by the works of the law. If you take those two scriptures and give them to me, just like they are right there, you can get up and preach that the law is done away with. Jesus Christ nailed it to the cross. And you can take those two verses. Now, for you to do that, you have to totally ignore the rest of your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We have a strange problem as Bible readers. We love to use what I call Roman rockets. We love to do drive-by shootings in the church. Theologians love to do drive-by shootings. What do I mean by drive-by? It's this simple. You drive by and you take two little bullets like the ones here, you put them in your gospel gun and you shoot them. And then you take off real fast. You, you don't wait for that verse to be explained. You don't consider the rest of the Bible, the whole Bible. You've got your two little bullets and you shoot everybody with those two bullets. Don't be a drive-by shooter. Study the whole word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And when you study from Genesis to Revelation, you're going to find that these two verses are saying something totally opposite 
of the whole Bible. How can that be? We're going to find out today. And our lesson entitled, Presenting Paul. Paul is the most misunderstood, misquoted, and the most misaligned prophet of all the apostles of God. But why is Paul so misunderstood? Here's why. Because Paul seems to have a little case of bipolarism. That's If you read his writings and you don't know how to interpret them, you're going to find two different things coming out of Paul's mouth. And if you don't know by the mind of the Spirit what he's saying, you could accuse him of being bipolar. I'll give you an example. Out of one side of his mouth, he's anti-law and only preach grace. But out of the other side of his mouth, here's what he writes. The law is good and holy and spiritual. And he said that grace was being misused. So here you have one apostle saying two total different things. Anti-law, grace only. And yet in another writing, he says the law is good and holy and spiritual. So which one is it, Paul? How can it be holy and you be anti-law? What about this? And on this side of Paul, he was against keeping the Sabbath and the holy days. And yet on the other side of Paul, he kept every Sabbath, holy days. And I'll show you today where he commands you to keep the holy days. But yet, if you listen to the modern church, they will tell you we're, we're under Paul's gospel now, a dispensation of grace. Let me just cut that in the bud from the start. There is no such thing as a dispensation of grace. You need to get dispensationalism out of your head. It has destroyed the Christian church. It was started by the Schofield Bible and Mr. Schofield himself. They created these ideas of dispensations. The early church knew nothing about dispensations. So when you talk about the dispensation of grace, you're, you're putting grace in a box. Ladies and gentlemen, the dispensation of grace, so-called, began in the Garden of Eden when God showed grace to Adam and Eve by killing a lamb and covering them with it. Grace is as old as God is. Grace is as old as Yahweh is. Grace didn't start with your generation. Neither does it end with your generation. God, that is one of the seven spirits of God, is grace. There will always be grace for the sinner, for the repentant sinner. So this idea that you and I are under grace, what was Noah under? What was Shem, Ham, and Japheth under if they were not under grace? Grace is God. God is love. Yahweh loves to show grace to those that need grace. So we must understand these things if we're going to understand Paul. On one side of Paul's mouth, he rejected all things Jewish in the church. And yet he was Jewish and he kept all the Jewish practices. I would like to show you something that very few people understand about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Peter was well-versed in the Old Testament. And these were the only scriptures of the church. The apostle Peter warned you and I about a coming day when Paul's writings would be sorely misunderstood. Let's read that in 2 Peter chapter 3. And we won't read 9 through 17. Let me correct that. Give me one moment. 
Let's go and read 2 Peter chapter 3, and I think it might just be verse 17. Hold on. If we were in Bible college, I would read the whole thing, but we're not, we're not there today. So 2 Peter 3. Is it 15 through 16? Okay, that'll work. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. It's All right, Rosie, book. tell everyone where you're reading and you can start reading. Okay, 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. In account, the long suffering of our Lord is uh, Yeshua is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable wrestle with, as the other scriptures also unto their own destruction. So what is Peter's, what is Peter's warning about Paul's writings here? I tell you what, let me call on one of our students and see what they got out of that verse. Uh, Sister Callie, are you there? Unmute yourself. And tell us what you just heard in those verses. You talking to me, Callie? Yes, or? Oh, Callie Sewell, okay. yes, ma'am. Good morning, Pastor. I'm kind of waking up too. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, well, in, I'm I'm reading from the book of Yahweh, and when she say Yeshua, it says it says Yahweh. So I'm kind okay. of confused a little bit. Okay. Okay, well, so no, let's let's talk about what we got out of those verses concerning Paul. Okay, and we're gonna go uh, just take them to distinguish. That, well, he said that some this is what I got that some verses are are hard to understand, but they can. Mm. That's correct. No, the, that, that's the answer <laughs> I'm looking for. Okay, so, so, so go ahead. Okay, so we those who are unlearned and unstable, meaning that it's hard to understand, but we can, they go together with, with other scriptures. So here's what Peter is saying. He is saying Paul's writings are very dangerous. To okay. who? To who are they dangerous to? The, the unlearned Christian and the Christian that wants to twist those words to their own destruction. I'll tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, that is a powerful warning from the Apostle Peter. He says that there are unlearned Christians that love Paul's writings. That is what Peter just said. Paul said that these are foolish Christians. They love Paul's writings because they can twist those writings to their own destruction. Why? Because anytime you're walking outside the law of God, you're walking in what? Your own destruction. And do you know how 99% of the Christian church justifies walking outside the law of God with Paul's writings? Does anyone have a comment to make, or how did those verses just affect you? Had you ever read them before? Did you understand Peter's warning? When I read those verses as a Christian, I had never seen that verse in 40 years of my Christian life. Did you know that? I had been in the Bible. I never realized that Paul, Peter, Paul comes with a warning label from the leader of the church. Sister L, go right ahead. Sister L, your hand is up. Unmute yourself. Sorry, Pastor Vaughn. Um, that was earlier. I didn't have oh, any okay. questions. I didn't see I that. I to turn it off. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? I I'd like to hear from someone that maybe that verse just affected you. You, you felt an aha moment. You saw, you're like, okay, Brother Thomas Shiflett, go right ahead. 
Hi, Pastor Shane. How are you this morning? I'm wonderful. I miss Chef Lett. <laughs> oh, I started picking up on that. <laughs> okay, that's good. Hey, I just had a thought come to my mind. Is this why we have so many different um, denominations in the church? 100%. 100%. Yes, ma'am. Because Thanks. of the misapplication of Paul's writings. You're welcome. Brother Marlon Hoover, go right ahead. Hey, Pastor Shane, how are you today? I'm wonderful, Brother Marlon. I, um, I, I've been in many, many churches, and I've read this scripture uh, a couple of times, and I always had questions of why this, was, this scripture was written. And I've always have been given the answer, um, I, I guess I was never really given the correct answer. It was always that they uh, would misinterpret Paul's writings right, and, and, and come up with something else. But those answers that they were given to the questions, when you look at other scriptures, they never... Uh, uh, were in one accord with one another. You're right. And and I've always said, you know, Paul, his writings are so amazing, but they are hard to understand. There you go. Because the church today has get has uh gotten rid of the old testament and that we're under Yahshua right. and under grace only. You're right. And, and that that scripture is so powerful. Um Amen. Peter said. That's what I wanted to hear, Brother Who Marlon. I wanted to hear that effect that it had on me. As a Christian, I, I still, I revere Paul's writings because now I understand them. To me, they're more beautiful now than they were before. Yes. Be because they, they don't make the word of God struggle against one another. Right. See, you, so you have the whole Bible, right? And then, and it's all in perfect continuity. And then you got Paul's writings, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and you can't, you know, it, the word of God has to dovetail that, that dovetail means it's got to fit just like that. It's got to be, yeah. a, and if it doesn't, either God's word is messed up and we know that's not the case right. or your understanding is messed up. And so Thank you for chiming in. Good to see you today, brother. Brother Christopher Aguan, go right ahead. Hi, right, good morning, Pastor. So I wanted to, so on this scripture here, it's very interesting. Um, prior to this Bible study, or even the whole Bible study we've been doing, um, I never really thought about it. But now it's so clear. I think it all comes down to not everyone actually knows about the kingdom of God. You're right. Now, after learning the kingdom of God, this scripture is matches it. Right. The, I mean, it's so clear now. That's right. So, and I think that's part of the reason going back to the many uh, denominations is because they don't know what the kingdom of God is. Brother Christopher, you just nailed something. You just nailed something that I tell my church all the time. Our greatest teaching at First Harvest Ministries is not the Sabbath day. It is not the holy days. It's not clean and unclean food. It's not even law and grace. It's none of that. The foundational teaching that sets our ministry apart from the whole world is the teaching on the kingdom of God. That is our separating message now. You know how a tornado has spin-offs? You know, they have, they, they'll, a big tornado will spin off other tornadoes, right? Well, all those other messages, Sabbath day, are all spin-offs of the kingdom message because all of those come out of understanding the kingdom. And Paul's writing, the one we're doing today, is a spin-off. Paul's writings is all because of what you just said. You've got to understand the kingdom of God. And if you're watching today for the first time, you must go watch our two-part series, 
on the kingdom of God. Brother Christopher has uploaded those already to our Bible study channel. All right. Let's continue. God bless you, everyone. We'll go right back into the lesson. Let's read the book of Jude, chapter 1 and verse 4. And while she's getting that scripture together, I would like to thank Melissa Parks. Uh, they just sent the church a $315 check. And it's from all the coffee sales. Y'all have bought coffee. Uh, we've had 104 of you that has bought coffee from the church. Uh, all the way from Georgia, Texas, Indiana, Missouri, Florida, Alabama, Virginia, California, Pennsylvania. I could go to oh, 105 of you. We bought coffee from us. God bless you. And thank you, Melissa, for sending us that $315 a donation to the church. Thank you all for getting your coffee. You can order coffee at totosarmyofpatriots.com. God bless you. Jude chapter 1 and verse 4. Jude, wait. Sorry. Okay. Y'all, there's a private joke about my wife in the book of Jude. I'll tell it to you in a minute. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God in our Lord Jesus Christ. And apologies for not having the book of Yahweh's translation on Lord there. That's okay. The book of Jude chapter, well, there's only one <laughs> <laughs> y'all never mind my wife she was reading for me one night and I told her I said Jude chapter so and so and she was looking all over for that chapter because there's only one chapter in Jude I was messing with her from the pulpit it was funny <laughs> anyway so Jude chapter 1 and verse 4 says that there are certain men who have been ordained from the beginning of time to creep into the church they creep in, they put on a collar or a robe or a suit, and they get in the pulpit, and they've been ordained by Satan as ministers of light to take the grace of God and turn it into what? Lawlessness. The word lasciviousness there, lawlessness. So we're living in a church age that despises the law of God. Now, let's see if Paul, what he had to say about lasciviousness. 2 Corinthians 12 and 21. Second Corinthians 12, 21. Pastor, I just want to say, I'm just so tired of being deceived. Amen. <laughs> I mean, since I, I mean, growing up in the Catholic church and I, I guess other people are too, but it just, it's just getting real old. <laughs> Tell me about it, sister. Thank, thank God you're hearing the truth now. Amen. Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall be well many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness in fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Now, here's the Apostle Paul. Now, I want to look at you when I talk to you now. Here's the Apostle Paul crying out against lasciviousness. And what else? uncleanness. Now I have a question for all of you. Where do you find the word unclean? Where do we get the parameters of what is clean and unclean? We get it from what? The Old Testament law, right? Mm -hmm. So if the Old Testament Torah is done away with, as everyone says, then why is Paul lamenting, weeping over the fact that the church is walking in lawlessness. 
Read that verse again. I want everybody to hear that verse. Read it slowly and everyone listen to Paul's weeping, his heartbrokenness, and let's see if we can make sense out of it. Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you and that I shall be well many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness in fornication in lasciviousness which they have committed. So Paul is so upset that in the church, in this grace church, they've got the grace. They've got the Holy Spirit. They talking in tongues and rolling in the floor, if you will. Okay. The Corinthian church, they was a mighty emotional group. All right. The Corinthian church was filled with the gifts of the spirit. Filled with charismatic revival, if you will. They were out of control. And Paul says, you're doing all of this, but when I get there, I'm going to be well. Because there is fornication in the church. Well, Paul, where did you get that fornication is a sin? You got it from the Torah. That, you're, that everybody says you've done away with it. Paul is saying there's lawlessness in the church. And he calls it what? Sin. Now, I want to break it down for every one of you. If the law of God is done away with, as you've all been taught, then let me try to, normally I illustrate this in my church with people. But since I don't have people now, let me see. i tell you what I'm going to use. I'm going to have to use these SD cards. That's all I got here. I'm going to line up five SD cards. Uh, if I had five hands, it'd be a whole lot easier. This SD card represents the law of God. Okay? The Ten Commandments, the Torah. This SD card represents grace. This card represents a sinner. Okay? This card represents the church. And this card represents the preacher. All right? So let's start with this card. According to the word of God, sin is the transgression of the law of God. If there is no law for you and I to break, then there is no more transgression. Someone read that verse for me real quick. I believe it's over in 1 John. Sin is the transgression of the law. Most people watching me right now do not even know what sin is. You grew up in a church. I grew up in a church where watching TV was a sin, where uh, a glass of wine was a sin, where um, uh, we couldn't even wear short sleeves. You know, our clothes had to be to the floor. Uh, everything was a sin. Let's go read. Thank you, Courtney. First John 3 and 4, Rosie. Would you grab that real quick? Now, I want to prove a point, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this on your test if I ever give you one. I want to know the biblical meaning of sin. What is sin? It's, it's, well, homosexuality is sin. Lesbian. We think of all of these things as sin, but yet no one can point me to where the definitions of sin can be found. All right? Let's find out what the Bible calls sin. And by the way, we're going to read this in your lovely New Testament. Yeah, that's the only people. You try to open the Old Testament, they won't even listen to you. So let's take it to the lovely New Testament. All right, read. Whosoever commits sin transgresses the, also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, was that written in the New Testament? Yes by the Apostle John. John tells you that the only way you can be a sinner 
is if there is a law to transgress. Well, according to your local preacher, Jesus did away with the law. According to Paul, we're no longer under the law. Oh, I'm not going to have time. I can tell it's 1030. Lord, help me. I've not even started. <laughs> we're, 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 so according to John, the only way you can be called a sinner is if you are violating the law of God. Read it again, Rosie, because I don't know if everybody really grabbed the meaning of that. Whosoever commits sin transgresses the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, if you have broken the law, what are you hoping for? A little bit of what? Grace, right? Mercy. Let, let's say you're speeding down the highway and the cop pulls you over and you have done what? You've broken the law. You're now a lawbreaker. And you're sitting there praying the whole time he's walking up to your window. Oh, I need a little grace. Police officer, I didn't know I was headed to church. I was headed to a wedding. Please, you know, I'm so sorry. What are you hoping for? A little bit of what? Grace. Brothers and sisters, this is the law of God. According to your preacher, where you go to church, I, yeah, even your church, they preach that this don't exist anymore, okay? Jesus took the law and nailed it up to the cross. That's not what he nailed to the cross, but I don't have time to teach it today. Took this and nailed it to the cross. So let me show you what happens by default. This represents what? Grace. Okay? Remember this one represents sinners. So if you throw the law away, as the church has done, why do you even need grace? <laughs> now, if you don't need grace anymore, then you no longer have sinners in the church. You don't have sinners in the whole world. Because what makes you a sinner, you have to have the law to be a what? A sinner. So if you get rid of the law, now we can get rid of sinners. And now we don't need grace. We definitely don't need the church anymore. And we don't need no more preachers. So if you get rid of the law, you got to throw the whole mess away. Do you hear me? You got to throw everything out when you throw the law out. You don't need grace. There's no more sinners. Don't ever have another revival. Why are you trying to save sinners? You don't even know what a sinner is. Amen. Amen. <laughs> When you throw the law of God out the door, you shut the churches down. Why? You're trying to get souls saved. You don't even know what you're trying to get them saved from. Oh, we're trying to get them saved from hell. No, you're not. The Bible said he come to save his people from their sin, not from hell. And what is sin? The transgression of the law. He came to deliver you not from hell, but from breaking the law of his father. Oh, hallelujah. Woo, glory to God. Amen. All right, let me get back because I've only got 20 minutes left and we had not even started. Let's read Romans chapter 4 and 15, then Romans 5 and 13. Romans 4 and 15. Because the law works wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Wow. Ain't that what I just taught y'all? <laughs> where there's no law. Somebody said, where there's no law. I'm watching y'all's mouths. Everybody come to class. Where there's no law. 
There's no sinners. So why are you having revival? The very message you're preaching to save sinners contradicts the message you preach that the law of God is done away with. All right, Romans 5 and 13, I believe. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So what did Paul just say, since y'all love Paul's writing so much? If there is no law, sin does not exist. And God cannot hold you accountable for breaking the law. He can, Do you know God can't even call you a sinner at the judgment without his law? If that's the case, then universalism is correct. Everybody's saved and forget the whole thing. Shut the churches down. And let's see, where there is no law, do you know that this is why Moses wrote the Torah? Many people believe that Moses invented this law and that it, it was a new invention. Ladies and gentlemen, the law of Yahweh is the heart of Yahweh. That's why David said, thy law have I hid in my heart. Because Yahweh's law is in his heart. It's in his mind. So if you tell me that the law began on Mount Sinai, then you don't even know what you're talking about. The law began wherever Yahweh began. What do you think Yahweh was teaching Adam and Eve every evening in the garden? Do you think they were talking about football? What were they? It was school time, ladies and gentlemen. They went to night school every evening. After their work in the garden was done, they went to night school with the Heavenly Father. What was he teaching them? The, law. the Torah, the law. How do you think Noah, before Mount Sinai, before the law was given, how do you think Noah knew which animals were clean and unclean to bring on the ark. Before the law ever existed, Noah knew what clean and unclean animals were. Where did he know that from? Because Yahweh had taught it in the garden. And so the reason the apostle Paul tells us the reason that Moses wrote the Torah let me find that scripture. I wasn't planning on bringing it up. I want to read to you why Moses wrote the Torah. Romans, nine, Romans 3 and 19. Go read that, Rosie. Now, remember what she just read in Romans 5 and 13. Without a law, no one can be a sinner. Now let's read Romans 3.19. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Without the written Torah, without the written Ten Commandments, Without Yahweh writing them down, you would have an excuse. See? It would be like if you go to court and you got pulled over for a speeding ticket and you go to court and, you know, the judge looks at you and you, your defense is that there was no speed limit sign on that road. And the judge tells the police officer, go ride down that road and tell me, is there a speed limit sign? The police officer comes back and says, your honor, somebody must have knocked it down. It's no longer up. Guess what happens to your charges? They cannot condemn you. They cannot give you a sentence. Why? It's not written down. Hallelujah. <laughs> Before the Torah was written, the whole world had an excuse. 
So Yahweh said, we're going to take care of this. That law that's always been in existence, Moses, write it down. And the apostle Paul said, so that the whole world might become guilty before Yahweh. That's the only reason Moses wrote it down. It always existed. Let's, let's think about what's in the Torah. Man shall not lie with another man like he lies with a woman. Do you think that God just came up with that in the book of Exodus? You don't think that was his law in the Garden of Eden? But until you can read it, it's just like the United States Constitution. Until I read it, I didn't know that Mike Pence had the power that he had on January the 6th. He could have stopped everything. And, and, and now, I read yesterday, the Democrats want to go change that in case that ever happens again. Why would they want to change it unless they knew in the back of their mind he could have done it and got by with it? See, when you write a law down, that's all you have to go by. The law of God is as eternal as Yahweh himself is. You don't have God's law for 4,000 years. And then under the age of grace, we're going to get rid of it. But it's going to start again during the millennial reign. What tomfoolery is that? Where do we get this poppycock? I, I want you to think about what your church taught you. For 4,000 years, God loved his law. For 2,000 years, he's done away with it. But we read in the millennial reign, the next 1,000 years, where the whole earth is going to live by that law, that Torah. But you and I, we get by with it somehow. It's a bunch of... Anyway, all right, I got to hurry. Uh-oh, time's running out. Airplanes don't wait. All right, let's go now. So, Brother Vaughn, everything you're, sa you're saying makes sense to me. But we got all these scriptures that Paul wrote right here that seems to say the total opposite of what you're saying. Why don't we're not going to read all of them? Why don't we take a, a, a smattering of them, a smithering of them? Romans 6, 14 and 15. And then we'll skip around. And just I just want to give you a sampling. Because this lesson has 48 slides, and I'm on slide number four. Lord, help us all. Let's read Romans 6, 14 and 15. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. What Verse then? 15. Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. This is a bunch of double talk. It sounds like coming from Paul. He just said, we're not under the law. We're under grace. But then in the next verse, he says, shall we continue to break the law? Because we're no longer under the law. <laughs> Has anybody really thought about how crazy that sounds? Now, the reason it sounds crazy is you're unlearned. You've listened to Joel Osteen so long. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call his name. You've listened to Joyce Myers. I didn't mean to call her name. I'm so sorry. You've listened to Benny. He I'm so sorry. Lord have mercy. You. <laughs> Amen. Get the point. You have listened so long to these for sale gospels that you don't understand. Paul said we're no longer under the law. I want to explain to you what that means, and I've got to do it quickly, so please try to grab what I'm telling you. Let me ask you something, Rosie, since you're on the hot mic. When you're riding down the road, Rosie, and you are obeying the law, does the law bother you? No. No. If you're going 55 and a 55, do you have to worry about blue lights? Mm -mm. You know why? You're free from the law. But the moment they pull you over and they ask you to step out of your car, 
and they put the handcuffs on you, you just came under the law. Under the penalty of the law that you broke. Ladies and gentlemen, notice what Paul said in those writings. Read it again. Go slow. I want to teach for a moment. For sin shall not have dominion, dominion over you. Now pause. Everybody loves the next line. For you are no longer under the law. They missed the first part. Sin. Or what? Law breaking shall no longer control your life. <laughs> See, before you received the Holy Spirit, you're, you couldn't help but break the law. And it kept you under the, the consequences of breaking that law. But now that your life story is not that of a lawbreaker, now read the rest of it. Since law breaking, change that word sin. Every time you see the word sin in your Bible, go back to the biblical trend, uh, definition of sin, which is what? Does anybody remember the biblical definition of sin? We read it a while ago in 1 John. It is the transgression of the law. Of the law. So take that word sin. When you see it in your Bible, get rid of that word. That's a generic word. The church loves that word generically. But let's bring it down to its common denominator. When you see the word sin in your Bible, replace it with breaking the law of God or law breaking, and you'll drive your preacher insane. So now let's read that verse, Rosie, with the definition I just gave you and watch it make perfect sense. For law-breaking shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we break the law because we are not under the law? <laughs> under grace? Does, does that even make any sense? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, he said grace was given to you. Grace was given to you, and you were given power over lawbreaking. You were given power over sin that you did not have. When Yahweh gave you the new covenant, he wrote his law in your mind. And that gave you power internally to not break God's law on a daily consistent basis. And now... You're no longer under the consequences of breaking the law of God because you have been given grace that others have not been given. Ladies and gentlemen, and then he said, now, now that you've been given that grace to where you don't have to pay the penalty of breaking God's law, which is death, you were given salvation where you will receive eternal life. You didn't deserve it. Now, I want to paint all of you a picture before I have to go. I want to paint you this picture in your mind. I want you to imagine with me, Brother Chris Arguan, that you have been sentenced to death row. I want everybody in the class to go with me right now and sit on death row in your mind. I want you to be inside of your cell knowing that today, today is your last day before they march you to the electric chair. You've got one hour left. The clock is ticking. You're down to 30 minutes. You've just had your last meal. The clock is ticking. You're down to the last 10 minutes. The clock is ticking. They come and open your door and you're prepared in your mind to go. And you look up and you see the warden and he's holding in his hand a letter and he hands it to you. And you read the top and it says from the governor's office, 
full pardon. Grace just came to your door. You deserve to die. You broke the law. But grace, unmerited favor, you did nothing to deserve Yahshua dying for your sin. You did nothing. Grace comes to your door. And after you've rejoiced a few moments, you're rushing to get out of there. You're free. You're no longer under that penalty of the law. You're free now. And they open the prison doors and you walk out a free man. What is your next move? To continue breaking the law? Or because of that grace, to gain a love for the law and go live your life now walking in the law so you're never back in that position again. I just explained to you what it means when it said, shall we sin because of grace? God gave you a pardon. Now do you go and live it up because of your pardon? Whew, I'm free from that prison of the law. So let me go and keep breaking it. And let me spit in the governor's face for his pardon. That's what we do. When we take the shed blood of Yahshua. I want to read it to you, and I've got to hurry. I want to read you a scripture. Hallelujah. I want to read you a scripture. Hebrews 6 and 6. The book of Hebrews 6 and 6. This is what we do when we walk out of that prison. What prison? You were supposed to die eternally. Do you understand me? Every one of you, including me, we had a death sentence to die eternally. To never be with our Heavenly Father for all eternity. That was your sentence. That was your prison. That's where you were. But a man named Yahshua, the son of Yahweh, was born and he died and took that death sentence upon himself. He came to your prison door and gives you grace to not have to die eternally now. The next move determines what you know about his blood. Was it your license to be free from the Torah? Was it your license to now go live your life in freedom? What you call freedom is what Yahweh calls bondage. And what you call bondage is what Yahweh calls freedom. I'll give you an example. On a Friday night, your teenager sitting there, antsy, wanting to go out with the people and go to the club, have a good time. They want freedom. And you, at your age, freedom looks like a recliner. <laughs> <laughs> Netflix and a recliner looks like freedom to you. Mm -hmm. You know why? You've been to the club. Mm -hmm. You saw what it did. You saw where it led you. Unwanted, un, not unwanted children, but unplanned children. Uh, all night of sex, not even know who you were sleeping with. Drugs, alcohol, all started where you thought you found freedom. It's in what you call bondage that you find freedom. The restraints of the law of God is the most beautiful freedom. Read, Rosie, what happens when we take our grace and turn it into grossness? 6-6, six, six, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. See, why don't we read that? Let's let's read the verse right before it, so we have the comment. about four? I think it's okay. Four, it is impossible, mm -hmm. and then take out. 
There you go. go ahead. For, for it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. Those were that were set free from prison, those that received grace, those for whom the blood was shed, once they have received that, and they've said you're free to go, you don't have to die eternally, read. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of Yahweh and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So what do you do whenever you go and you live in your freedom outside of the Torah? You spit in the governor's face. You trample on the blood that gave you your freedom. You take grace and you turn it into grossness. You know what grace is supposed to do? It's supposed to make you turn to that governor that set you free and say these words. Your honor, before I came to this prison, I had no respect for the law. I had no respect for my, for any part of society. I was my own free man. But while I was here, I learned that that life was my bondage. I lost freedom looking for freedom. So mm -hmm. your honor, I've been here long enough to know that if I never want to come back, I must walk. In, your, in the law of this land. And now I'm ready to be a law keeper. I'm ready to obey the law. Many of you know my personal story. Some of you don't. But 20 years ago, I made some bad decisions in my life. And I went away for three years. Before I went away, I was a lawbreaker. When I came out, I was a law keeper. <laughs> and I've kept it from that day to this day. You know why? I found out real quick. My liberty is in the law. Do you know that in the United States, we have more laws on our books than any other nation? And yet we're the land of the what? Free. The free. It is our laws that keep us free. And yet, we want to say that Paul was against the law of God. I want to show you something, and then we've got to go. I just want you to look, guys. We've not even gotten started. We have not even gotten started. There's so much on this subject. I don't look. Are you I, sharing your screen? Huh? Are you sharing your screen? Oh, I thought I was. Have I not been sharing it this whole no. time? You're kidding. It says my screen is on. Oh, it's not been up the whole time? No. Oh, there it is. Can you see it now? Yeah. So, y'all, we're on slide number four. And look, we have not even started this lesson. Look, I didn't even, I don't know. There's, there's so much I've got here to teach y'all. When you get through with this lesson, you will never look. It just goes on and on and on. <laughs> I don't know. This is what that's my a month's worth. Let's have a do over, Pastor. That's a month right there. That's a month. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's a month. That's true. Well, if you were in our Bible college, we would do this during an entire day on Saturday. We would take that morning and go all day and teach. So why don't we do this? Let's pick up next, uh, where am I at next weekend? What are we doing next weekend? Uh, where am I at next weekend? Uh, whoo, what is next weekend? December the 4th. Oh, I'm in, I'm in Branson, Missouri with Doug Billings. Okay. But you know what? Wait, no, Saturday. No, I can do next Saturday morning. We don't fly out till that Saturday afternoon. So we'll do next Saturday morning, 11 o'clock. You know what? We better start a little earlier because I'll catch a flight that day as well. Why don't we uh, shoot for 930 again next Saturday morning? 
All right, and uh, let's see if we've got any other questions. Sister Sandra Broliar, God bless you. Good morning, and God bless you. It's been a beautiful lesson. Um, I do have a comment about those who say the law is done away with and teach it to others. Okay. Okay. And that is, if they they're liars if they say that because if you say to them, well, if you believe the law is done away with, I'll be over to your house tonight to get a few things that I want. <laughs> they would probably say that was against the law, and and not just the law, but how about I'll be over tonight to sleep with your wife? Right. So I don't think they're sincere. I they're think not. they really know in their hearts that the law of God is there forever, yes. but they are doing it for other reasons. And and what and it's what Paul, it's what Peter said to their, uh, they twist it to their own. In other words, they want it to be done away with. Yes, they do. Yes, they it's, do. And they twist those writings. I would like to say this. The commandments of the Lord are pure yes. and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than Ooh. much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey of the honeycomb. Please tell us where you're reading from. I don't know. I have that memorized. That is beautiful. Quote it again. It's Old Testament. Quote it again. I've heard it before. Quote it the again. The commandments of the Lord are pure and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey of the honeycomb. They're so good and so pure that I'm going to send Paul to do away with them. Yeah, right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Oh, wow. And by thank the you way, for this lesson. Thank you. And by the way, your artwork behind you, is that your work? Yes. That is beautiful. Oh, wow. Those sunflowers would look so beautiful somewhere in my home. Well, don't say price. that. You know, I threaten people that if you say you like something, you may get it. <laughs> Amen. Well, you know, you know my P.O. box. You know how to find it. Hallelujah. Oh, I have I have a question. Yes. I yes. sent uh, an offering to the uh, just a moment to, to the, the P yeah, 235 Old Spanish and it was returned. Oh, OK. Thank you. It is oh, yeah. Oh, let me see it. You sent it to the church address. Yeah, at, at 235 Old Spanish. Okay. And, and they returned it. Yeah, it has to go to the P.O. box. Everybody grab your pens. Okay. Gotcha. Go ahead. It's, it's P.O. box 2757. And that's Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Say that again. Bay, B-A-Y. Okay. St. Louis. St. Louis. L-O-U-I-S. Mm -hmm. Mississippi. Okay. Three nine five two one. Uh, and Thank by the you. way, if you're sending tithes and offerings, please do not send them in my name. I don't want to pay taxes on all of that <laughs> at the end of the year. Yeah, um, okay. I, so I'm please sorry. send it to First Harvest Ministries. Okay. You have a blessed day. Thank you, darling. Where are you from? Northern California. Oh, wow. Well, it's good to see you. All right, sister. Uh, I don't know your name. It just says iPhone, I-J-E. It's Jane. Oh, oh, there's sister Jane. Yeah, I didn't see you. I was just going to ask, since you weren't able to share the slides that we've gone over, could you share those so that we can, can I study those? I believe it's in that booklet, in the, the booklet that you download, the PDF. Okay. I think. Yeah, that's pretty okay. much that booklet. Okay, okay, all right. Okay. That's all so I everybody download it. Okay, all right, thank you. Sister you have Jane, a hurry up and get moved down here now. Okay, I'm trying. <laughs> you, have a safe, you have a safe trip. By the way, anyone that would like to, uh, a community to live in, we have uh, three acres of land that we're going to call Kingdom Acres. The Home of Hope will be on that land. But we're also going to uh, allow people to build. We're going to have like a little retirement community for our widows and our elderly. You can build a tiny home for $20,000. Our men in the church will build it. And it'll have 
a bedroom, kitchen, bath, a living room, cute little home, and you can live right there among the saints. Amen. Sister Anu Meacham. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, you said don't put, send it in your name, and I've been sending it to PayPal. Oh, so PayPal is connected to our church account, so my account, it can deflect that. I don't have to take, I don't have to claim that. But it goes to you, to your name. Uh, John Vaughn is only the name on the PayPal account itself, but when it's transferred to the bank, it goes to First Harvest Ministries. Oh, okay. So they I'll wouldn't keep... let they wouldn't let me set it up in the church name for some reason at PayPal. I, I think I had to send my personal information. I'm not sure why that was. Okay. Um, but we've been very worried about that because um, one lady on here. I'm not going to call her name out, but uh, Lord, she sent us maybe the biggest offering we've ever had last week. It was such a blessing, and and so. Um, you know, when we set PayPal up years ago, it, you know, it was not, we had no idea this was going to happen. And so, but we did talk to PayPal. And as long as those funds are directed to the church account, then we should be okay. And it, and it sets a lot of people off. It puts them off because they see the name John Vaughn. They don't know that I'm John Vaughn. And no, that is not aliases. My mother named me John Stephen Shane Vaughn, and because my daddy wanted me named after him, John. My mama loved that Western movie in the 70s. Come back, Shane. She wanted me named Shane. My grandmother wanted me named after Stephen in the Bible. So instead of tying up and having family war, they just threw it all together, and I've been cursed with three names. So, <laughs> Pastor Shane is Kali. My husband also has three names, and he's okay. there. So it's, it's like a norm. Shane Frederick Bernard. Okay, so maybe that was a 70s thing. Yes. All and right. he named my words down with three names. Oh, well, so. there you go. Keep the tradition <laughs> going. I put yeah. All my sons have three names. I wanted them to carry my burden. All right. Oh uh, Miss Shiflet or Mr. Shiflet? Hello. Hello. This is Shiflet again. Is Shiflet again. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, just in regards to what we were speaking about today, um, just things that popped into my, my head with Moses and getting the Ten Commandments, um, I'm thinking about creation when God called forth things, and being that the Hebrews being in captivity, is that how they lost the law, and basically yes, the Ten exactly. Commandments being pulled back forth, and I just, this also um, brought to mind, I just recently watched your Servant Slaves and Sons sermon, uh, bringing, bringing us into the fold under our maturity, and yes. I just want to say, I think uh, the Lord's using men like you to call back truth into Amen. our church. Thank you. That is a powerful sermon. If you've not watched it, everyone, it's called Servant, Slaves, and Sons. I think there's two or three parts to that. You mm -hmm. definitely want to watch it. Now, before we take the next few, uh, real quickly, I just want to say this, and I, I don't like to talk about this in our Bible studies, but we've not talked about it lately. Remember, please remember that we uh, receive a benefit every time you shop at buybuywalmart.com. For those of you that are not shopping with us every month, we plead with you. You can help our ministry and get everything you need for your house, everything from your dishwashing liquid to your shampoo, your makeup, whatever you need. We have it all. And it'll be at your house within two to three days. And they send us about 10% of your purchases. So please, if you're already enrolled, don't forget to shop this month. And if you're not enrolled, go to buybuywalmart.com and make an appointment. And one of our dear worker bees will call you and get you enrolled. And we'll thank you from the bottom of our heart. Also, for many of you that's been asking me about gold and silver, uh, godsmoney.info. Go and enroll in the coin of the month program and you'll get gold and silver, God's money, every month shipped right to your house. Godsmoney.info. Brother Marlon Hoover. Okay. Um, I, I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Pastor Shane. You've been such a blessing to me and my mom. I've been uh, praying so long 
um, to have Yahweh send me a true prophet. And I ran across you when I was out on my phone on uh, the internet and something just told me to just listen to you. Wow. And I've been telling friends about you. And I said, this man is anointed and sanctified by God. Wow. I've been, I, I've, I've had many preachers. My grandfather was a preacher. And they all preach the Babylon. That's right. Um, and, and you're the first that has preached God's word and truth. And I thank you so much because it really touches me. And when I listen to you, I feel the Holy Spirit on you. And I feel it on me when I listen to you preach. And I try to watch every YouTube uh, channel um, uh, video that you have, uh, have out there. And I've been taking a lot of notes. And I thank you. And I... From the bottom of my heart, I love you and your, your wife. I thank you so much that God has anointed you to do what you do. You're a blessing to the world, to the few that have opened the door. Brother, also, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you from um, the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Uh, you had a YouTube uh, channel. Uh, here just a few weeks ago, maybe about two weeks ago, and they, uh, we, you had said, remind me at the end, and it was about cremation, and I can't okay. find it anywhere in the You're Bible right. that cremation is biblically. Right. And You're I, correct. I was wondering if you could do something where maybe you could say yes. now. I'll do it real fast. We do have to roll. I've got to go, yeah. but real quickly. Cremation always has been. Now, let me say before I start, we don't take a hard stand on this issue um, only because I'm, I, I try to remain silent where the scriptures are silent. But with that said, cremation has always been a pagan practice. Um, we know that Abraham was buried. David was buried. And there's a reason for that, because they all had faith in the resurrection. Um, now, I do believe that no matter what happens to you, you're going to be resurrected. But it is a practice of Israel. You'll never find anyone cremated in the land of Israel. The, the Jewish people understood that that was a pagan practice. So if you've done it, well, no, hopefully you haven't done it. You're still here. But if, you know, please don't take that as condemnation or guilt yeah. in any way. Uh, but going forward, you may seriously want to reconsider your choices. Is that fair enough? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. All right, quickly, one more. sister. I'll take two more, Courtney and Elisa. Sister Courtney, go right ahead. I can't hear you, Courtney. I can hear you, Courtney. hear me now? Now, yes. Okay. So I was doing a Bible study a couple of weeks ago and I posted in the group chat, like some revelation God gave to me. Um, like in the Old Testament, it talks about how God's word is a light and a lamp to our feet. And then I was reading in Genesis in the very beginning, it said that God, that Yahweh separated the light from the darkness. And this just gave me revelation. Like that was his commands. That was the first thing he did is he, he came up with his commandments. That's you're right. And matter of fact, if you'll go watch my YouTube video called the um, uh, the oh Lord the bride. Let's see uh, something about the bride. No, no. Anyway, scratch that. I can't remember. But I talk about that whole subject. I'm losing count of my sermon titles and, and how to refer back to them. But um, real quickly, hold on. Now, folks, I haven't even started packing yet. And I have to be on a plane in two hours. So we're going to do this quickly. Uh, Alisa and Jennifer Armstrong. And then finally, Elder Ricky Homridge. And we'll be done for the day. I'll make my super on, Jennifer, Good morning. Before, before I move on, Eric Blackman just made a statement I'd like to refer to. 
he said many people cannot afford direct burial. And Eric, I understand that. My father passed away and uh, it, was, it was a burden. I, I get that. So here's what I would say. Um, I say this about the Sabbath day and everything else. Intent of the heart, you do the best you can. You do the best you can to try. If you fall short of that, then grace is always in full supply. So don't be condemned or convicted over the cremation burial thing. We do recommend burial. If you cannot do it, on the Sabbath day, if you get hungry, your hunger comes before any Sabbath command. The Bible talks about that. And so in those situations, grace comes into the picture, okay? So don't be condemned. Jennifer, uh, Elisa, Elisa, Elisa first. Go ahead. Hi, good morning, uh, Pastor Juan. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, wonderful uh, uh, Bible uh, study uh, this morning. Um, should we uh, ask a lesson today about grace and the law? And should we concern that uh, we... Uh, okay, I'm trying to leave first my question that... Uh, what to take on that uh, could we uh, uh, how say that uh, can we lose our salvation <laughs> I, I'm just sorry it might be a dumb question but I I just I just no, I'm not laughing at the question I'm laughing at how how much of a can of open worms that is oh man uh Alisa uh so if I answer the question then I've got to explain my answer and that is a well, long process. So but, give you a uh, homework. <laughs> okay, no, no, I've taught on it many times. It's on my YouTube channel. But the answer to your question is, no, see if I give you the answer, it's gonna confuse a lot of people because I don't believe you can lose your salvation but, because I don't believe you have your salvation yet. Okay. Okay. Very confused. That's why I didn't want to answer. see that. You see how you said, okay. See, <laughs> now I've got to explain what that means. So the process. Uh, <laughs> I tell you what, go, Alisa, uh, uh, and watch my video on YouTube. The title of it is Born Again. Thank you. Type in Shane Vaughn, Born Again. And get ready for a humdinger is all I can tell you. Thank you. Uh, have a safe trip uh, there and uh, get home safe. Thank after. you. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Armstrong. Hey. <clears throat> Real quick. I know you got to go. Who will the saints reign over at the first resurrection? We dealt with that, I think, in part two of the kingdom of God. If you want to go back and look at that at the end, I had them read the scripture of the nation, the nations of the saved. Um, Y'all bear with me. I've been fasting. I'm not spiritually fasting. I'm doing intermittent fasting. And it's been a while, so I'm feeling a little weak right now. But I brought it up. In, in that part two, the nation of the saved. So real quickly, the saints will be ruling over everyone that does not come up in the first resurrection. And there will be billions of them, Jennifer. Okay. So and they, they are, where's it at in the Bible real quick? Oh, the nations uh, just, I believe it's Revelation 21. Hold tight. Let's see. I'll find it for you. Y'all pray for me. I hate airports. I hate them with a passion because I have to be good. I can't complain about my mask. I can't be a jerk. I have to be sweet about wearing that mask. That's the only place I can not be, you know, I, you can't be crazy in the airport. <laughs> uh, Revelation 21 and 24. Okay. And okay. just read that whole 23, 24, and you'll find out that there's the city where the 144,000 will dwell. That's the overcomers. That's the first okay. resurrection people. And okay. they will be ruling and reigning over the nations of the saved. 
All right. Thank you. You're Have welcome. Trip. And I'll tell you what, go back, Jennifer, and watch my YouTube video called The End Times. Yeah, we've and, been watching it. Okay. And then watch The Two Resurrections. I have a video called The Two Resurrections. Okay. Watch those okay. and it'll really help you understand. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We love you, Jennifer. I hope everybody is coming to next year's retreat in October. You need to register if you're coming. Totosretreat.com and use the promo code Sabbath for a $125 discount per adult next year, October 5th through the 9th. Finally, Sister Justina. Okay, so there's um, a lady named Rhonda, and she had a question. She said she couldn't raise her hand. Okay. But she says Romans 6, 14 through 15 are questions, not statements. Oh, uh, okay. I don't know what scriptures you're referring to. I think it's some of the ones that we read earlier. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, they're questions. It's, it's just like when I'm teaching and I ask questions, I'm really trapping you into an answer. So that's what that's how Paul taught a lot like I did. He asked questions and uh, those questions was really a statement, but they were posed in the form of a what? Question. Mm -hmm. I ask questions. I'm making a statement with my question. It's so, like asking your kids if they've been into the cheese and you already know they have you are, been. You, as a matter of fact, what you're really telling those children, I know you've been in the cheese. Yeah. Right? But you're mm -hmm. you're saying, you're saying, so who's been in the cheese? What you what a mama's really saying is I know who was in the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Brother Peter Montanez and Sister Montanez, bless you today. Unmute yourself. Okay. okay. God there bless. Go. God bless. You. Bless you. It's the first time I'm on this channel, my wife and I. And um, wow. Yeah, it's the first time. We're out here in Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, I have a sincere question. I've been with the Church of God Incorporated basically all my life. Which one? Uh, the one in um, New Britain, Connecticut. Okay. Yeah, does, they're. Um, does that come <laughs> from the? That comes from the Worldwide Church of God. No. Okay. No, okay. Not, no, we we have our own um Okay. Yeah. Um it's been around since um the 1939. Okay. And I'll, the base I'll check it out. Yeah, the foundation of it or the base of it uh, uh we say the mother church is in Puerto Rico. Okay. Okay. Um I've been with that um um conservative de denomination. Okay. Um, I'd like to send a shout out to everybody who's actually watching and, and listening and, you know, receiving the the sound teachings of the word. Amen. Um, I like to go to the grain. Um, that's the way I am. And the way that we've been taught in our congregation, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to be brief because you say sure. you, you know, you, you're pressed for time and everything. I understand that. Sure. As a minister of the Lord, um... I understand that certain denominations teach certain scriptures the way some of the um, students were commentating, commentating. And the question is, we are taught that the Old Testament is not that it's been violated or extracted or left behind because the New Testament is a New Testament and Jesus Christ gave a better testament than the Old Testament. Now, as I listen to your teachings and everything else, I, my mind just flies all over the scriptures. Sure. And the question is, um, when you're talking about Paul and the Leviticus law and everything else, well, they taught us that that's been done away with right. the practices, the practices right. of the Jews. And my question to you is, what is your take about, since you're talking about the Sabbath, because our denomination runs around with the Sabbath. That's it's a Sabbath um, movement, oh, um, but it's not. It's observed. It's not being. Um, how is it practiced the way the Jews used to practice it? Sure. 
So now my question to you is, um, I'm, get, I'm getting a blur here. Um, <laughs> hey, that's how I, I get it. Um, I, I think you're asking me, how do we separate the correct. different, the different correct. nuances of the law? Right, because okay. they practice, uh, and, and it's going to start all over again in, in, in the new beginning, but right. um, about the sacrificial and everything. But since the elect were the Jews, <laughs> so here the what they usually used to call in the beginning the heathens, or better yet, the Gentiles, which is us. Right. Um, we don't sacrifice animals. We don't do none right. of that stuff because it's against the law. Right. So my question to you is, what's what's your take on that? Okay. So that, as you know, is a loaded question, and yes. it's going it's going to require. And I do have the you know what we believe, and I've taught on it. As a matter of fact. Um, so excuse me, I'll be at your house tomorrow. Right? I'm, I'm Come on down. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we'll cook some good food and talk about it. <clears throat> may, okay, I re- may I recommend a series that I taught on our, on our YouTube channel, and it's called The Layers of the Law. Okay. If you want to write that down. She's yes, writing it down. I think it's a five-part series. Okay. The Layers of the Law. Layers of the law. Now, I've seen that video. Let me say I mean, this quickly before I jump off of here. And I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. Right. I didn't want to put you on the spot on that either. I want everybody no, else I to hear that. The question. To know that. Watch those videos. And I think by next week, Sabbath, when we're all back, I think you may know where we come from a little bit better in, our, in our mindset. Yes. We are so we are anti. Judaism. Okay. As much as we're anti Catholicism. Right. We are not trying to be Jews over here. Correct. Even though in Christ we are Jews. Well, that's true. That's true. But as far as the nation of Jews, if you will, the, the, the secular, let's put it that way, any ism that adds to the word of God or takes away, we're against it. Right. And Judaism did that as much, if not more, than Catholicism did. Oh, yeah. Okay. We take the law of Yahweh in its purest form without the Jewish additions. Right. Okay. And we explain that in the layers of the law. I'll give you a real quick example. The father actually commanded us to eat on the Sabbath day. Right. If we were hungry. Right. The Jews said, no matter what, you can't eat. In other words, you can't prepare food. You can't do anything. And that's why they hated Yahshua. He was out taking food and doing what they called work. Right. With their added rules and their added regulations. And so we are not those people. Correct. Although, uh, you know, and I could get, let me give you another example. Uh, the Jewish people took away the name of our father completely. Right. They they passed the law that you cannot say his name when Yahweh said, declare my name among the nations. Correct. And they replaced Yahweh with Hashem. Right. Which is simply Hebrew for the name. Well, that's not the name. And so they're as bad as the Catholics are. And the Pentecostals and the every ism. Mm -hmm. So we strive to find that. Y'all, I'm going to be late for this play. I'm sorry. I apologize. We we can pick this up at another time. I get it. Go study those and then let you go. Go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. Just being the motherly and oh, tell yeah. you, get that fly. Go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Brother Ricky Homeridge, are you out there? I see your hand up. Yeah, I want to see if you want to do the, uh, the blessing. Yes, let's Thank do you. our blessing and let's bid everyone Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Okay. Here we go. Um, Yahweh spoke unto Moshe saying. Everyone raise your hands and receive the blessing. Yahweh, uh, Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh's face shine upon you. May he be merciful to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So this shall put my name on the children of Israel and shall bless them. And also I blow the shofar. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Hallelujah. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Have a safe trip.